Welcome to this week's Bible study. We are continuing in the book of Job. This is our third week in the book of Job. And this week, we learn how to be a good friend uh, to someone who is suffering from a tragedy. In some ways, by learning how not to be a good friend to someone who is uh, suffering some sort of a tragedy. When our foster son, who later became our adoptive son, David, was about two years old, uh, the Department of Social Services told us that they thought that he would be returning to his mother before too long. And This was right at the holiday season, and so uh, we, with a fair amount of uh, sadness in our hearts, went through the last Thanksgiving with David and the last Christmas with David, and then in January he was probably going to be going back to his mother. And and during that time, of course, we went to spend time with family, as you do at holidays. And, and in one of the holiday uh, gatherings that we were at, one of my aunts, uh, who is now deceased, was there. And um, she was just trying to make us feel better. We were all upset about David going back and worried about him and all that kind of thing. And, and what she did to help us try to feel better, though, was to tell us these horror stories that she had heard about other children who had been foster kids and had gone back to their parents and they were abused or murdered or, you know, whatever. And, and you know, that wasn't helpful. Now, she was trying to be helpful, and we actually recognized she was trying to be helpful, and, and it was okay in that sense. Uh, but uh, uh, just in case you didn't know, if a foster kid is getting ready to go back to his uh, original home and his foster parents are concerned about it, uh, don't tell them uh, uh, horror stories about uh, how it happened to some, what happened to some, some other kid. And something like that really happens to Job. His three friends come to be with him, and we mentioned this, I think, last week. Uh, and for seven days, they simply sit with him in silence. They can't say a word. They are so shocked at how far he has fallen. And in many ways, that's when they do their best ministry uh, with him. And I would say that the best ministry we can ever do to someone is simply show up. Uh, I have been guilty of this, and many others have as well. Uh, someone is going through a difficult time, and we're there for them maybe initially, and then we just kind of forget. Or maybe someone in church just kind of disappears, and they don't come for a while, and we're afraid to ask or afraid to do anything, and so we just don't show up. And not showing up can be worse than showing up and doing the wrong thing. So Job's friends do the right thing. They show up, and yet then they begin to speak. And as we already know, everything they say is the wrong thing to say. Uh, they're trying to, to do the right thing. They're trying to help Job, but they end up saying all of the wrong things. Our lesson writer, George Estes, says that John Calvin preached 159 sermons on the book of Job. Uh, pretty hard to, to imagine uh, for me. Uh, but one of Calvin's insights was that Job represented a good case, but he pled his case poorly, and that Job's friends, on the other hand, brought a poor case, but they explained it much better. And in some ways, Job's friends just really believe that the world works, and as long as we do the right things, the right things will happen, and if we do the wrong things, the wrong things will happen, and they make a good case for that, and Job, on the other hand, he has a harder case to make because the world isn't working for him, and so as Estes says, Job finally comes to realize that uh, there is an incomprehensible majesty of God, and that incomprehensible majesty, the particularly the incomprehensible part, uh, prevents us from fully understanding God's purposes. And that's not fully uh, uh, satisfying to us, and it's also not uh, fully um, uh, understandable, of course, to us. It is, by definition, incomprehensible. But that is the better case. Well, for today's lesson, we're going to consider some of the things we should say and shouldn't say to folk who are in tragedy, and we're going to learn a little bit from Eliphaz the, the Temanite in Job, the fourth chapter. And so Job's first friend who speaks is Eliphaz, and let me share with you uh, what he has to say, at least a little bit in part, the first nine verses of the fourth chapter. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered, If one ventures a word with you, will you be offended? But who can keep from speaking? See, Job, you have instructed many. You have strengthened the weak hands. Your words have supported those who were stumbling, and you have made firm the feeble knees. But now it has come to you, and you are impatient. It touches you, and you are dismayed. Is not your fear of God your confidence, and the integrity of your ways your hope? Think now. Who that was innocent has ever perished? Or where were the upright cut off? As I have seen, those who plow iniquity sow trouble and reap the same. 
By the breath of God they perish, and by the blast of his anger they are consumed. So at first, Elevaz might be a little bit tem- tem- tentative. Uh, uh, can I have a, a word with you, Job? Uh, but pretty quickly, his tone changes as he essentially blames Job for his condition. And we need to be aware that we often are going to be guilty of or tempted to blame others for their condition. Because if I can blame you for whatever's going wrong with you, then I can think that I am somehow insulated from it. As long as I don't make your mistakes, I won't face what you're facing. So he blames Job a little bit. And he reminds Job that Job has comforted many, many people uh, who are suffering tragedies. And maybe Job has said the same things uh, that Eliphaz is saying. It's easy for us when things are going easy and well for us as they were for Job, perhaps as they had been for Eliphaz, to assume that the world just makes sense. And if it falls apart for you, that must be uh, something that you did because uh, it's still working for me. Um, And so Eliphaz says, but now it's come to you and you are impatient. And it's interesting, in the fourth uh, chapter here, we we get Job described as impatient because so oftentimes we talk about the patience of Job. It really is the the, the, um, uh, steadfastness of Job or the long suffering of Job. It really isn't so much the patient patience, but he never lets go of God. And that is his central character, his central tenet. And that's what we need to really uh, um, understand. Well, uh, Eugene Peterson, whom I used last week, uh, he translates uh, Eliphaz's questions to Job this way, and these really are the central questions for, for the whole book, from Job's friends to Job. Think, has a truly innocent person ever ended up on the scrap heap? Do genuinely upright people ever lose out in the end? It's my observation that those who plow evil and sow trouble reap evil and trouble. One breath from God and they fall apart. One blast of his anger and there's nothing left of them. And in some ways that sounds like it makes sense. Uh, And in in some ways that does make sense. Sometimes when we do good, uh, we do prosper. But we aren't promised just because we do good that we will prosper. And oftentimes when we do evil, we're going to suffer for that evil. But sometimes the evil seem to... Uh, 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 prosper, and we have lots of examples of that as well. And, and and really examining what Eliphaz has to say, it falls apart pretty quickly when he asks, "Have you ever known a truly innocent person to end up on the scrap heap?" And the answer is, "Well, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, have you ever known anybody who's innocent who faced great tragedy? Well, yeah, and, and sometimes maybe it even is me. I feel like that that, that might be the case." And Job himself will say it later in the 12th chapter when he says, The tents of robbers are at peace, and those who provoke God are secure. And we could name names probably and know people who are are robbers but seem to be secure, who provoke God, and yet uh, they seem to be at peace. As the book wears on, Job's friends uh, become more and more exasperated with him, and he becomes more and more exasperated with them. They argue back and forth on which one is the most wise. They call each other names. The friends don't understand. Job, why don't you just confess whatever it is that you did that was wrong, and then maybe God will forgive you and will relent from this punishment. And Job can't understand why his friends won't listen to him. I'm telling you, I'm not perfect, but I didn't do anything to deserve this much tragedy. Well, we could spend the rest of our time today uh, looking at those arguments uh, and, and, and seeing them go back and forth, but I really want us to move on into the application, and I want to do that today in a different sort of way, perhaps. I want to share with you a video. It's from a Washington Post interview, and it's with Kate Bowler, uh, who is a Duke Divinity School professor. Uh, she was diagnosed uh, right at the very prime of her life. I think she was 35 years old. She was diagnosed with stage four cancer. Now she was a Duke professor at this time, which is a big deal in case you don't know that. Uh, she had a, a marriage and a wonderful husband. They had a young child. Her life was just on the up and up. And then she gets this devastating diagnosis, and uh, um, she was not supposed to live, but she did and has. Uh, and she has kind of now made a career out of helping us figure out uh, what, how to make sense uh, with the things that happen to us in life that are completely uh, nonsensical. And I really appreciate her. She's got a podcast that I listen to all the time. Uh, there's another person I interview on this same uh, uh, on this same interview, and that is Wahajit Ali, and I don't know him or know of him before I saw this interview, but he's a journalist, and he had a young a daughter uh, who was diagnosed with stage four cancer herself, and he shares with us 
uh, as well uh, um, what went on with him. And so I want you to see this interview as some examples of what we can say and shouldn't say and some of the ways that we can reach out to people who, uh, like Job, find themselves in great, great tragedy. On your podcast, Kate, that you realize that loving you was causing people pain and that like your friends were all going into therapy because they were yeah. so shaken by their young, vibrant, 35-year-old yeah. friend, professor, mom coping with this. Yeah, it does. that was kind of a weird shift. And that's still not something I'm totally used to is like suddenly you're the worst thing that's happened to people. And it's hard not to see it that way. You're like, loving me will kind of maybe destroy you <laughs> is when you look at your like sad, beautiful parents, and they like just launched you, right? Like you had the kid, you finally are living your life, and then you just, you feel like you're just taking it all apart. Mm. So it is, it's, it's just a funny thing though. Like the second you're diagnosed, you suddenly do feel like you're, to, to strangers, you're a problem to be solved. You're like a riddle. Like, why did this happen? Sorry, I have no, 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 no. <laughs> it's great. I actually wore very absorbent cotton. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Strangers are trying to figure out why it happened to you, not them. Like, was it something you ate? Was it in your family? There's it's just like this... they want the reassurance that I'm safe from this. You're over like, here. Yeah. Like, like, what? Yeah. And not, not that it's your fault, but like, what is the secret code? What did you yeah. do that I can avoid doing? But I'm it not going to get it. Could be my fault. I was being wheeled into a procedure a couple weeks ago, and the nurse on the way in, and mostly nurses are spectacular, but the nurse on the way in was like, "Oh, colon cancer. Man, it must be stuff you guys are eating nowadays." And I was like, "This is not helpful." <laughs> so, did you say yeah. something to her? Did you just let it? Did you just let it go? Uh, I was like, just it was like it was just pre the mask like on the were, face. You, I was like, "This is not Exactly. Anesthesia hasn't kicked in yet. Like struggling <laughs> against the anesthesia, oh, no. uh, but I, that's it's it's pretty common for me to get the the commentary, mm -hmm. and and that's mostly just what I want for people like us is just for everyone to realize everyone's life is so much more fragile than we expect, right. and just to have a little more charity and less of a deep desire to explain it, out of a an intense anxiety that I mean every person suffering creates this problem right but not this person and I get it but like don't make the suffering people resolve that for you mm -hmm. I find out that I've had to become um, we've had to become people's therapists mm -hmm. it's very interesting yes. like like I have to calm people down once they hear about my daughter's diagnosis yes. and I'm sitting there thinking like I should have gone into in the therapy I'm really good at this <laughs> and then I think about it I'm like wait a minute I'm the father yes. what's happening we should all be and other people now. are crying like you don't know how I'm dealing with this right now it's really <laughs> affecting me yes. and which is fine because there's empathy and I understand it's coming from a place of love it's coming yeah. from a place of love but it's but imagine doing it and, and this we're, we're in the thick of it right like you said the fog of war two months in but that's why people I think who Family members or those who are suffering from cancer, I think the reason why sometimes they avoid public places is I was just at an event on Sunday, and once you walk in, everyone gives you the look, oh, the dad. Yeah. And then you just get the look. The look is like this. <sighs> and you could see the looks. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, I, felt, I feel like I could just press play on the same talking points, but you have to repeat the same talking points. Mm -hmm. How is she? How are you? And you're like, I understand the empathy. And then you yeah. have to just sit there and go through the motions. And after 20 minutes, I was so exhausted. Mm -hmm. yeah. And my son was exhausted. And he's like, yeah. let's go home, Baba. I'm like, yeah, let's go home and have pizza. <laughs> and, and you can't knock people because what, what else are they supposed to say, yeah. right? But, the, but like you said, is it becomes draining. Yeah. And, and, well, let's talk about yeah. some things that people can say. Yeah. I mean, yeah. because you know, well, Kate's book, Everything Happens for a Reason, and yeah, Other Lies I've Loved. Yeah, definitely say that. Lead with that. Like, lead with that. <laughs> and then you talk about how people, you know, God needed an angel. Sure. You know, yeah. so, so what are things that we can avoid saying? And then, and, and then more importantly, what are things that, that actually help? Like, what sure. have you found that's been helpful? Well, because most of it comes out of these just very thick cultural scripts we have around positivity. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's, I mean, it's, infected all of us where we feel like we have to have both explanations and then reassurances mm -hmm. either a kind of religious determinism where there has to be a plan god isn't giving you anything you can't handle yeah. um which is which is they're they're running the math right like everything that's happening to you there's an equal sign and i'm going to tell you about what happens at the Formula. other side and and it'll even out i swear and that's such a tough none of that language is helpful because it assumes that they know what's going to happen, which I would love to meet more fortune tellers and seers, just prophets of all mm -hmm. kinds. Mm -hmm. um, but they can't promise me anything, and I don't need them to promise me anything. So um, all of the, have you tried this, or when my aunt died, everyone's aunts are always doing very poorly. 
uh, when I talk to them. Um, and so all those desires to relate are so lo lovely and tempting, but they, they always end up giving you information that's either a burden or a weapon mm -hmm. used to explain why it's me. Mm -hmm. So the things I just love are, I don't know, when people take a part of who you were and let you feel like you're still that person again, maybe you still hope to be funny someday, <laughs> or, um, or just kind of test the waters. I love it when people just say, um, I heard what happened, I want you to know, and then just something lovely, like, you know, I'm praying for you, I'm thinking of you. And then just a little pause, and then let the person take it where they want to go. Because so easily, I'll, I'll, you know, I became devoted to talking about reality show programming, just to have my <laughs> you conversation believe what's topic. happening on The Bachelorette this season. <laughs> uh, but just give us the off-ramp, yeah. just so that we can be more than one thing again. What's been helping you get through this time in terms of, well, we can talk about uh, sort of the, the bigger picture of this, yeah. but just in terms of the, the little gestures, what family's been able to do, um, some of the mechanics right. of, of what's helpful for you right we're, now. I mean, we're talking about this right in, in DC. I'm originally from the Bay Area. Uh, my wife's from Florida. So in DC, we're like, we don't have the village. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we have two kids, right? So just having a parent come, and my mom just coincidentally happened to be visiting when this diagnosis happened, that was mm. a huge relief. We have an ecosystem of friends who are just very lovely and sweet, and I just want to appreciate everyone's kindness. There's something about when your baby gets cancer, mm -hmm. it brings out people's inherent decency and kindness to the point where I got this Twitter message as I was saying, someone, some guy said, I hate you on TV, <laughs> I hate all your opinions, I hate you on Twitter, but I just want to let you know my, my uh, mom is praying for you. Uh, and I'm like, thank you, sir, I think. Uh, and so, you know, just kindness. I think this is common decency and kindness. Someone coming up to you with that short statement, I heard what happened, I'm thinking of you, anything I can do, let me know, pause. And then also there's just something about that normalcy factor yeah. two months in, which is really nice. Like people want me to be me again and mm -hmm. talk about other things or the warriors losing think congratulations to canada uh <laughs> pain uh but just you know or here practical stuff ready mm -hmm. grubhub cards yeah that's right uh all right doordash yeah. uh we appreciate the toys i have so many toys right now i gotta donate these toys uh but someone coming in saying oh you have a kid ibrahim i have kids maybe he'd like to just hang out with our kids mm -hmm. just small gestures like that to bring back a level of normalcy. And that's what we've seen has really helped our family. Because again, cancer just doesn't impact Nuseba. I have a five-year-old boy yeah. and Sarah and, you know, just, oh yeah, I have to work. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> life and pay the bills. Uh, but just, I think it gives a person an opportunity to exercise kindness and decency without the script and the tropes. Yeah. And it's an interesting opportunity, if you want to take it, to test yourself if you, can, if you can be that person. I think that video is encouraging and it's helpful. Uh, and it is to me. I hope it is to you as well. i uh, not wanting to really beat a dead horse, but I want to continue with this theme just a little bit more. Uh, one of my friends in the horse world is a woman named Melissa Warden. And long story short, uh, she lost a leg in an accident uh, 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 some time ago, and she has taught me so much about what it's like to lose a limb, about how hard it is to have to fight and climb back, about about the the joys and the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, terrors and 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 tragedies of trying to get through all of this. Uh, and uh, one of her little phrases is uh, the comeback is better than the setback and, and that's a wonderful phrase and I try to remember that for myself sometimes uh, and she's been a huge huge uh, like I say inspiration to me uh, she says not to tell amputees how inspiring they are but I tell her that all the time because she really is and some of it is how honest she is about her herself and her experience and it has just helped me so much not only deal with folks who are suffering similar things but but deal with others as well and I want to read to you a little essay that she just wrote this week and I was getting ready to do this and I read this and I thought wow I really need to use this and so she says uh, what to say and not to say to someone who is an amputee and she says say I love your leg not say well look at you getting around say that's a sexy leg not say I'm so glad you didn't die and then she re responds to that and says even if they may almost have died you don't know so so don't be a jerk and remind them of trauma she says say I like your foot can you tell me about it not grab your child and drag them away while they're trying to ask questions about the robot foot 
And then she goes on to say, and finally, if you see an amputee, tell them, and there's no other better word to use than the word she uses, so I'm just going to use it, tell them they are badass. And she is, trust me, a compliment their leg and ask if you can ask them about it. Please don't tell them how inspiring they are because they have a disability. Don't ask if they know, insert any amputee's name here, uh, or make derogatory comments about how they probably lost their limb. Also not acceptable is questioning someone with a disabled placard uh, part in a handicap spot. If they walk well, then there's likely a reason why they have that placard. A prosthetic is one of the many legal reasons for having a premier parking spot. And then I just love her final paragraph. She says, I'm in the minority of being proud of what I've accomplished and my beautiful sockets that allow me comfort on long days and high activity levels. Most people are embarrassed to be an amputee and live with trauma and depression from the loss of limb. I appreciate people attempting to connect to me and my new form. I'm guilty of being awkward around others with disability, including other amputees. That being said, we all can do better with how, with how we interact with others that have a disability. If they don't want to talk about their prosthetic, don't be offended. It's likely they don't know how to talk about it and don't want to draw attention to themselves. Meanwhile, people ask what happened to my knee and I respond that I lost my leg. We all have our own way of dealing and interacting. I happen to have a demented sense of humor. And part of what I hear her saying is that each person is different. Let's trust them, as, uh, trust that they're different and, and recognize that, that we can ask questions and kind of feel our way through and then find a way that we can best be their friend. And I hope that all of this has been helpful. The Washington Post interview and the little essay that Melissa uh, wrote has been helpful. The one thing I want to make sure that it isn't is making you tentative or making you afraid to say anything or to do anything uh, because I think that would be a major mistake. And as Melissa said, even as an amputee, she said, I can be awkward around amputees, but that doesn't stop her from trying. And so I think we need to make sure that we try. Job's friends showed up. They didn't fall into inaction because they didn't know what to do or what to say. And simply showing up is enough. Uh, maybe asking first, but giving someone a hug and just saying, I'm so sorry, can be uh, all they need. Uh, Job's friends get huge credit for showing up. Now they probably shouldn't have started speaking and clearly I think they should have done a better job of listening uh, but Job did appreciate their efforts and we know that because at the end of the book God says Job's friends were so ridiculous I'm gonna kill them all Job I'm just gonna get rid of them they won't be in your life anymore you don't have to put up with them anymore unless you want them to be a part of your life and if you ask me then I will not kill them and Job prays on their behalf. He doesn't appreciate everything they have to say, but he recognizes they were trying to help. And he gives them credit for that, and they remain friends even to the end. And I suspect that that is true for most people who are going through trauma as well. I knew that my aunt, the things that she said, she wasn't trying to make us feel bad. She was trying to make us feel better. She just didn't know how. And I appreciate the effort, even if I didn't appreciate the things that she had to say to us. And I bet you have some stories like that as well. And so let me uh, share maybe a four-part plan for what we might do when we discover that a friend of ours has come into some time of great tragedy. And and, and one the uh, part one is show up. Simply show up. When my grandfather died when I was in, in a tragic automobile accident when I was 10 years old, the very next morning, my pastor showed up at his house. Now, they lived about three hours away from us, and for a 10-year-old, a three-hour trip in the car was an eternity. So for my pastor to show up, I knew he had gone way out of the way to come and be with us. I don't remember anything he had to say or do. I don't think he stayed that long, but he showed up, and it made a difference on me. One of the reasons I'm a pastor today is because... Uh, my pastor showed up. Number two, pray up. We hear all the time with all these gun uh, deaths and all of this, this stuff going on, well, thoughts and prayers are not enough. And it's almost a sense as if prayer is not something we do actively. But we truly can and do need to pray for people. And part of what we're doing when we're praying is we're asking God, tell me, God, how am I supposed to respond? Give me the strength and the wisdom to know what do you want me to do about this situation? In many ways, we see prayer as praying to ask God to change something. But more often than not, I think when we pray, it's God changing us. Here's what I want you to do in order to respond to this situation. Likely God is going to say to us, go and show up uh, at that person, with that person. Pick up the phone and make a call. Uh, write a letter, whatever it might be. So one, show up. 
two pray up, three listen up. And boy, let me tell you, as Melissa uh, uh, confessed, I confess as well, I'm a motor mouth. Uh, she confessed being awkward. I'm confessing I'm a motor mouth. Uh, we really ought to listen. When people are going through tragic times, all times they just need to talk. And they may want to tell us the story again and again and again, or they may want to talk about something completely different. Uh, you heard... Um, Kate Bowler say she just wanted to talk about what she was seeing on the talk shows and, and during her illness she didn't have much to do but be able to watch TV. She couldn't do much else and so that's fine. Talk about the latest movie. Talk about whatever happened on the latest uh, daytime uh, reality TV show. That's fine but listen up. Let them do the talking and you respond and then finally grace up. And by that I mean, ask God again, how can I help? But so often the way we can help is find tangible ways to care for other people. Uh, so often when someone dies, uh, we take a casserole to the family. And I call that, it's God's grace in a dish. And it almost literally is God's grace in a dish. When we show up, we are uh, Jesus Christ in the flesh for them. I become the hands and the feet of Christ. And when I give someone a hug, that may be Christ uh, hugging them. Find a way to grace up. In, in the interview, uh, uh, both uh, Ali and Bo Bowler said, uh, uh, give gift cards. Uh, 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 you may not need to bring a whole bunch of toys to the children. Maybe they have enough toys, but give gift cards. If you think the kids need toys, bring toys. Find a way to grace up. And so a four-part plan. We should show up. We should pray up. We should listen up. And we should grace up. And if we do that, I trust that our friends will know that we care and we love about them. We'll make a difference in their lives. And God will be able to say, you did a great job. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well, until next time, let me remind you that we can do all of these things because indeed God is with us. Amen.